U.S. Navy history arriving. Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. I am Dale, and I am joined by Steven, my XO. Ahoy there. So today we're going to start on the Seminole Wars. It is also known as the Florida Wars. This was around three conflicts in Florida between the Somali, which is a collective name given to the various groups of the Native Americans and black people who were settled in Florida in the early 18th century. And, of course, the U.S. were the main belligerents. Now, was Florida still a Spanish colony at this time? Or is this after it was, in theory, U.S. territory? So Florida became a state in 1845. So this would be both. This would be before and it would be after. Because this goes from 1814 to 1858. Oh, okay. So this isn't a nice, nice, tidy little, you know, seasonal campaign. Right, well, this is also three wars. Uh, when you said conflicts, I was imagining three engagements. No, this was three whole wars. Dang nabbit, Florida, you were being crazy even back then. So the belligerence is the United States versus the Seminole, Chigataw, and Freedmen tribes, and Spain. So during the revolution, the British controlled Florida at the time of the revolution. And they recruited the Somalis to raid frontier settlements in Georgia. During the confusion of this war, it also allowed slaves to escape to Florida. And the British promised the slaves freedom when they fought with them. So because of this, the United States looked at them as enemies. In 1783, as part of the treaty ending the Revolutionary War, Florida was given back to Spain. Now, Spain's grip on Florida was very light. They only had a small garrison at St. Augustine, St. Mark's, and in Pensacola. And they had no control of the border between Florida and the U.S. A number of Somali groups occupied towns on the United States side of the border, and American squatters had moved into the Spanish side of the border. Now, when the British were in there, they had divided Florida into East Florida and West Florida, which the Spanish decided to retain those division when they got it back. West Florida extended from the Appalachee River to the Mississippi River. So with Louisiana, the Spanish controlled the lower reaches of all of the rivers draining from the United States west of the Appalachian Mountains, which prohibited the U.S. from transport and trade on the lower Mississippi. But wasn't Louisiana... Wait, this is the 1700s. Never mind. Scrub that. Yep. Still Spanish. Yep. So, in addition to the U.S. wanting to expand west of the mountains, they wanted to acquire Florida because they wanted to gain free commerce from the rivers and also to prevent Florida from being used as a base for a possible invasion by a European country. So when the U.S. did the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, they were able to get the mouth of the Mississippi River into their hands. But a lot of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee were drained by rivers that went through Florida to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the U.S. tried to say that the Louisiana Purchase had included West Florida, but the Spanish were like, no, that's not what it was. (laughs) Yeah, understandable. So, a few years later, the Patriot War happens. This is just a small conflict between the American residents of Baton Rouge who decided to overthrow the local Spanish government and seize the uh, fort there and then requested protection from the United States. So President James Madison authorized the governor of the territory of Orleans 
to seize West Florida from the Mississippi River all the way east to the Perdido River. Oh, yeah. nothing bad could possibly happen from that. He was actually only able to occupy the area west of the Pearl River, which is the eastern boundary of Louisiana. So then Madison decides to send George Matthews to deal with the disputes over western Florida. So allow me to recap. Just make sure I'm on the same page. Mm Mm-hmm. American squatters in a Spanish territory overthrew the appointed Spanish government in the Spanish territory and then said, hey, United States, you mind uh, backing us up on this one? And the United States said, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I had my eye on that piece of property. You know what? You're A-OK in my book. In fact, keep going. You're doing great. You are on the same page. Okay. What the hell? So, the governor of Western Florida actually gave a offer to the U.S. to turn over the rest of Western Florida. And then said, nah, I ain't doing that. So, Matthews goes to East Florida and incites a rebellion. Now, the residents of East Florida were actually just happy with the way things are right now before this happens. So the U.S. raises a force of volunteers in Georgia saying, hey, come do this thing. We're going to give you free land. So in 1812, this forts of quote unquote patriots with the aid of Navy gunboats seize Fernandia. You say patriots. I'm hearing mercenaries. Yeah, they're mercenaries. They're being paid by free land. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, President James Monroe, he authorized this. And then later he was like, nope, I didn't do that. Nope, I didn't do it. Ah, so this was America's first uh, false flag operation. Now, these patriots were not able to take the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine. And the increasing tensions between Great Britain with the War of 1812 on the horizon, this pretty much put an end to the USS's incursion into East Florida. So round one came out to be a draw. Much like the War of 1812. The only winner in war, gun manufacturers. Now, in 1813, the American forces were able to seize Mobile, Alabama from the Spanish. Well, huzzah, huzzah. Wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. Why? We weren't at war with the Spanish. Well, I'm pretty sure that since we're trying to take Florida from the Spanish, it was just a target of opportunity. Okay. We're taking Spain's stuff now. Hey, why just do Florida? Let's take Mobile, Alabama, too. We're kind of at war with the British at the moment. I don't think we need to piss off another European power. I mean, the Spanish's hold on the territory was starting to wane anyway. They had already sold most of the Southwest to the U.S. So, I mean, they pretty much had Alabama and Florida. Okay, so this was just using the five-finger discount in the confusion of war. Yeah. This brings us to the First Seminole War. Now, the dates of this are pretty much up in the air. The Army says it was 1814 to 1819, while the Navy says it's 1816 to 1818. And as this is the U.S. Navy History Podcast, I imagine we're going with the second one. Well, another Army source dates it as 1817 to 1818. So... We're going to mesh up the two and go with the Navy dates, 1816 to 1818. (laughs) So there was a conflict called the Creek War. This is when Colonel Andrew Jackson became a national hero because he had a victory over the Creek Red Sticks at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Now, was this before or after New Orleans? Because I thought he was already a national hero from that one. This is 1814. Very, very 
good pair of years for that guy then. So I think that places it a bit before New Orleans. So after this victory, he is able to force the Treaty of Fort Jackson onto the Creek tribe, which results in the loss of a lot of the Creek territory in southern Georgia and also central and southern Alabama. So because of this, a lot of the Creek tribes left Alabama, Georgia, and moved to West Florida, which was controlled by Spain, and, and decided to join the Seminole in the fight in Florida. Yeah, can't really blame them for that one. So, as we know, when Britain was fighting the United States, they saw a lot of good things in recruiting Indian allies. So in 1814, the British entered the mouth of the Appalachia River and gave arms to the Seminole and Creek warriors and also a bunch of escaped slaves. They then moved upriver and began building a fort at Prospect Bluff. A company of Royal Marines relocated to Pensacola in 1814. And Captain Lockyer of the HMS Sophie, he estimated that there were about 1,000 Indians at Pensacola. 700 of these were warriors. So a couple months after the British and their Indian allies were beaten at Fort Boyer, General Jackson and his forces drove them out of Pensacola and back to the Appalachia River. And then they finished the fort at Prospect Bluff. They, they were like, hey, hey, look, that fort, good bones. We need that fort. We're going to finish it. Yeah, that's a solid foundation. You know, this is, that, that that's some good framework right there. You know, if, if we had given you a month or two to finish this, this could have been a very defensible position. Thanks for the idea, guys. And thanks for getting us started. Now, when the War of 1812 ended, all the British forces left the Gulf of Mexico, except for a Lieutenant Colonel Nichols and his force in Spanish West Florida. So why do you stick around? Because that was Spanish territory and they were allies. So why not? Fair enough. No, no, he... he he was there to direct the provisioning of the fort at Prospect Bluff with cannons, muskets, and ammunition. He told the Indians that the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812, guaranteed the return of all Indian lands lost during the war, which included the creek lands in Georgia and Alabama. So he stayed there to incite the Indians into more conflict. I was going to say, like we, we went into that a little bit, and I recall the British and American territories being uh, declared to return to the previous borders, but I don't think we said anything about Native American territories. Nope, they did not. So the Seminole, they had no interest in manning this fort, so they went back to their villages. So when Nichols left, he ended up giving the fort to the escaped slaves. And also... A few of the Seminoles that he had originally recruited for possible incursions into the U.S. territory during the war. So this fort also had a racist name attached to it because of this. And I'll leave it up to you to know what that racist name is because I'm not going to say it. Let's just say that um, the Americans were worried that it would inspire their slaves to escape to Florida and or revolt. All right, I, I have to look. I'm, I'm very... I'm going to hate looking this up, aren't I? Here, you don't even have to look it up. No, no, you know what? I'm just going to say it. God damn it. Yeah. I'm... That's not as bad as I thought it might be, but god damn it. Yeah. So, after the garrison at this fort kills a group of American sailors, General Jackson decided that it had to go. Now, he did acknowledge that this was Spanish territory, so he informed Governor Jose Massot of West Florida that if they did not eliminate this fort, he was going to. So the governor 
tells the general that he did not have the forces to take the, the fort. So Jackson assigns his brigadier general, Edward Pendleton Gaines, to take the fort. Gaines told Colonel Duncan Lamont Clinch to build a fort that they were going to call Scott on the River Flint, just north of the Florida border. He intended this fort to be a supply post from New Orleans via the river, but since this would mean passing through Spanish territory past the, past the enemy fort, it would allow the U.S. to keep an eye on the local tribes and that fort. They were also hoping that the fort would fire on the supply boats, which would give them an excuse to go in and destroy it. So building the fort, not only as a defensive position, but essentially to bait out an attack. So they have a justified reason for uh, a Casas Bali. Yes, because even in that time, they realized that racism wasn't enough. I have so many things I want to say. (laughs) <laughs> but we're trying to keep this relatively PG to PG-13. Yes. Uh, a lot of the uh, U.S. expansionism stuff is going to be just a lot of face palming and me biting my tongue. So, in 1816, a supply fleet for Fort Scott reached the river. And Clinch took a force of... More than a hundred sailors and 150 Lower Creek warriors, which included the chief. I'm going to butcher the hell out of this, but I'm going to give my best go. Tusnagi Hutni, which, if I pronounced it correctly in their language, means white warrior. Now, he took these forces to protect this passage. So the supply fleet met Clinch at the enemy fort and two of his gunboats took positions across the river from the fort. The former slaves in the fort fired their cannons at the U.S. soldiers and at the creek, but they had no training in aiming the weapon. Of course, how would they get the experience? Nobody was going to teach them how to do that. Right. Now, of course, once these guys opened fire, the Americans fired back. And they actually had training. Yes. Now, the gunboat's ninth shot was a hot shot. You remember what those were, right? Uh, I know it. It's on the tip of my tongue. My my gut's saying double load, but that's not right. No, this is when they heat the cannonball to where it's glowing red. Oh, right. And I made the comment of like, wouldn't that warp the barrel and cause a lot of damage to your cannon, but... Maybe, maybe not. So, this hot shot lands in the fort's powder magazine. Oh, no. Yeah. This explosion, as you can imagine, destroys the fort and was more... and was heard... This explosion was heard more than 100 miles away in Pensacola. And that, folks, is why we recommend wearing hearing protection. So, there were 320 people in the fort that they know of, which included women and children. And there's a reason you're using past tense. The reason I'm using past tense is because this was 1816. So no matter what, they're all dead now. Yeah, I I don't imagine many live past 1816 after an explosion like that. 250 of them died instantly, with a number of more dying from their injuries a little bit after that. But once the U.S army destroys this fort they leave so after you know all this bloodshed and death american squatters decide to come down and raid the seminole tribe killing their villagers and stealing their cattle so of course this tribe grows resentment and they retaliate by stealing back the cattle Yeah, how dare they? How dare they steal back their own livestock? Harumph, I say, harumph. Indeed. So that brings us to the Foul Town and Scott Massacre. Oh, I'm going to hate this, aren't I? Foul Town was a 
Mikasuki Village in southwestern Georgia, about 15 miles east of Fort Scott. And just so I'm on the same page, Mikasuki is a, another tribe, I assume? Yes. Okay. The chief got into a dispute with the commander of Fort Scott over the use of land, which was on the eastern side of the Flint River. He was pretty much telling the commander that all of that area was Misaki territory. Now, the land in southern Georgia had been ceded by the Creeks in the Treaty of Fort Jackson, but the Musakis did not consider themselves Creek, and so they did not feel bound by the treaty. Whereas the Americans considered them, well, you're native, and that's close enough for us, I assume, right? Of course. An Indian's an Indian to these people. They're just... They considered them as savages. Right. And... Since they didn't consider themselves Creek, they did not accept that the Creeks had any right to cede their land. So, in 1817, General Gaines sends a force of 250 men to seize the native village, Fowltown. So, the first attempt was successfully defended by the Misukis, but the next day they were driven from their village. Some historians date this as the start of the war, which was November 22nd, 1817. Now, a week later, a boat carrying supplies for Fort Scott was commanded uh, by Lieutenant R.W. Scott. They were attacked on the river. There was around 40 to 50 people on that boat, which included 26 soldiers, seven wives of soldiers, and probably some children. Most of these passengers were killed by the tribes. And one woman was taken prisoner. Prisoner? I am now the president of the Somali Wars. Well, I didn't vote for her. <laughs> Strange women being abducted off boats is no way to base a system of government on. And one woman was taken prisoner. So out of all these people of, say, on the high side, 50... Six made it to the fort. Not great. So, General Gaines was under orders not to invade Florida. But... He has his inciting incident now. He decided to allow short incursions into Florida. So, when the news of what is now called the Scott Massacre reaches Washington, D.C., you can probably guess what happens. Huh... Savages, savages, barely even human, savages, savages. Gaines is ordered to invade Florida and pursue the Indians, but not attack any Spanish installations. Yeah, something's telling me he's not going to follow that little instruction. Now, he doesn't get this order because he left East Florida to deal with pirates who had occupied Fernandia. Ah, so the Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, orders Andrew Jackson to lead the invasion of Florida. So Jackson gathers his forces at Fort Scott in March of 1818, which has 800 U.S. Army regulars, 1,000 Tennessee volunteers, and 1,000 Georgia militiamen, and around 1,400 Lower Creek warriors that were friendly to them. Now, regulars versus volunteers versus militia. Militia, obviously, you know, locals volunteering out of a sense of defending the community. But volunteers and regulars are regulars on army payroll and volunteers just aspiring troops? Regulars are regular American army. Right. Militiamen are state army. Okay. Volunteers are just volunteers. They are there to kick ass, take name, and America. They want to kill them some Indians. God, I hate history sometimes. I agree. And I hate that Jackson's leaving this one because that guy hated Native Americans. Yeah. So, he enters Florida. He marches down the Appalachia River. And they reach the site of the Fort who we will not name, that was blown up. 
So Jackson constructs a new fort there. Fort Gadsden. I feel like Fort Crater would have been a more fitting name, but okay. Fort Boom. <laughs> After completing the fort, they set out for the Masuki villages around Lake Masuki. I probably mispronounced that. Spell it. M-I-C-C-O-S-U-K-E-E. -E. I'd say McCusky, but... M McCusky? Yeah. English is weird, and that definitely isn't an English name originally, so... Both of us are probably wrong. Yeah, that's not English. <laughs> <laughs> so the Indian town of Tallahassee was set on fire March 31st. And the town of Misuki was taken over the next day. They destroyed more than 300 homes. Then Jackson turns south, going to St. Mark's. He arrives there around April 6th. Once he gets there, he seizes a Spanish fort. You had one job, man. One job. Don't do that. You can get your jollies off. You know, slaughtering people who frankly don't deserve to be slaughtered. But you had one instruction. Leave the Spanish crap alone. So, at the fort, Jackson finds Alexander George Abernoth, Scottish trader working out of the Bahamas. Okay. He traded with the Indians in Florida. He has written letters to the British and American officials on behalf of the Indians, trying to help them out. I'm liking this guy. And it's rumored that he was selling guns to the Indians to prepare them for war. I'm liking this guy even more. Now, more than likely, though, he was selling the guns to the Indians because their made trade item was deer skins and they needed the guns to hunt deer. Now, two Indian leaders, Josiah Francis, who was a Red Stick Creek, he was also known as the Prophet, and a man named Homathilimiko had been captured when they had gone to a American ship that was flying the British Union flag which was anchored off of St. Mark's. Now, as soon as Jackson arrives at St. Mark's, these two guys were brought ashore and hanged without a trial. But, and I know Jackson uses the excuse, I'm sure, of they're not citizens, they don't have any rights to a fair trial, but... Not cool, that's just cold-blooded murder. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, after hanging these guys, he leave St. Mark's to attack villages along the Suwannee River, which are occupied primarily by escaped slaves. So on April 12th, the army finds a red stick village on the Econfina River and attacks it. They kill about 40 of these tribe members and capture about 100 women and children. Now, they do find a woman named Elizabeth Stewart who had been captured in the attack on a supply boat on the Appalachia River last November. Oh, so we found the president. So, at this point in time, Jackson declares victory because he's pretty much destroyed the major... Seminole and black villages. So he sends the Georgia militia and the Lower Creeks home and takes the remaining men to St. Mark's. So at around the same time, a man named Robert Ambrister, who was a formal Royal Marine and self-appointed British agent, was captured by Jackson. Okay, we're at peace now. Why does he need to be captured? Because he's British. Okay, so because Jackson's a crazy, rules don't apply to me guy. Gotcha. Look at how much he just massacred. His bloodlust is still up. So he starts a military tribunal and charged Abernoth and Ambrister 
with aiding the Seminoles and the Spanish, inciting them to war and leading them against the United States. Now, Ambrister throws himself on the mercy of the court, and Abernoth said, nope, I'm innocent. He says he was only engaged in legal trade. But they sentenced them both to death. Oh, my. But then they decided that Ambrister, since he threw himself on the mercy of the court, he was going to get 50 lashes and a year of hard labor instead. And then, a little while later, reinstates his death penalty. So Ambrister was executed by firing squad on April 29th of 1818, and Abernot was hanged from the yardarm of his own ship. Okay. How the heck did we avoid an international incident from this? We'll get to consequences. Okay. So Jackson leaves a garrison at St. Mark's and goes back to Fort Gadsden. He says that when he got back, everything was peaceful, so he would be returning to Nashville. And then later he says that Indians were gathering and being supplied by the Spanish. So he leaves Fort Gadsden with a thousand men heading for Pensacola. Now, of course, the governor of West Florida was like, uh, most of the Indians at Pensacola are women and children and that the men are unarmed. Yeah, I'm guessing that wasn't good enough. Yeah, Jackson did not stop. Cool. So about 15 days later, Jackson reaches Pensacola and the governor and his 175 men garrison, no doubt, they retreated to Fort Baracus, leaving the city of Pensacola to Jackson. So Jackson and the Spanish garrison, they exchange cannon fire for a couple days and then the Spanish surrender on the 28th. After this, Jackson left Colonel William King as the military governor of West Florida, and he goes home. So as you can imagine, there were international repercussions to what Jackson did. I can't imagine why. John Quincy Adams, who was Secretary of State, had just started negotiations with Spain for the purchase of Florida. And of course, Spain protested the invasion and seizure of West Florida and suspended the negotiations. Yeah, that's pretty understandable. Now, Spain did not have the means to retaliate against the United States or to take West Florida back by force. So Adams let the Spanish protest, then issued a letter blaming the war on the British, Spanish, and Indians. In this letter, he does apologize for the seizure of West Florida and said that it had not been American policy to seize Spanish territory and offered to give St. Mark's and Pensacola back to Spain. So Spain, since they really had no other thing they could do, they accept and eventually they resume negotiations for the Florida sale. So, of course, this was all in defense of Jackson's actions and sensing that this actually strengthened his diplomatic standing. They demanded that Spain either control the inhabitants of East Florida or just give it to the United States. An agreement was reached when Spain did give East Florida to the United States and then renounce all claim to the West. So they were bullied into giving up their own territory. Yes. All right. Now, Britain, they protested the execution of two of their subjects. I wonder why. Keep in mind, these guys never entered United States territory. Mm-hmm. There was talk in Britain of demanding reparations and taking revenge. Now, of course, this brought fear of another war with Britain. Now... In the end, Britain realized that the United States was a pivotal part of their economy now and decided to maintain good relations. So nothing happened. 
Now, there were repercussions for America as well. Congressional committees held hearings into the trials of Ambrister and Abernoth. Let me guess. They found that while they were a little rushed, nothing ultimately happened to those that were uh, pushing for their deaths. Well, most Americans supported Jackson, of course, but some worried that he could become a, quote, man on horseback, a Napoleon, and transform the United States into a military dictatorship. Now, Congress reconvened in 1818, in the month of December, and introduced resolutions condemning Jackson's actions. But here we go with the popularity contest. It failed because he was too popular. Now, the execution of these two British people did leave a stain on him for the rest of his life. Couldn't have been that bad. He was eventually president. Exactly. It was not enough to keep him from being president. That was the first Seminole War. How does that feel? Like, I need to take a shower. Very long, very hot shower. Okay, well, you go do that. Next week, we will continue with the first interim before the second Somali War. How does that sound? If you need me, Captain, I, I'm going to wash up and just try and forget this awful, awful few years. I don't blame you. If you guys would like to reach out to us, you can email us at U.S. Navy history podcast at gmail.com you can tweet at us at usn history pod thank you for joining us steven anything you would like to say before we sh pull back into port what's that captain i'm lathering my hair okay th this is a process it takes a while uh fair winds following seas you, you whatever bye guys and he just dropped this soap that's not good U.S. Naval History Podcast, departing. <laughs>